Um, I am very, very pleased to introduce Dr. Gary Kilgore, Linfield's new athletic director. Gary is just the fifth athletic director at Linfield since 1949, and he joins a proud legacy of Hall of Fame athletic administrators who preceded him. He is no stranger to Linfield, having served as longtime faculty member and academic chair of the Health, Human Performance, and Athletics Department. He came to Linfield in 1989, where he coached track and field and cross country for 17 years. In that capacity, Dr. Kilgore was a six-time NCAA West Region Coach of the Year, a seven-time NWC Coach of the Year, and was honored as the conference's men's cross country coach of the year after having led Linfield to the team title in 1994. He also headed Linfield's track and cross country programs during the transition from NAIA to NCAA Division III in the mid 1990s. In 2000, Gary coached Linfield's first individual NCAA Division III national champion when he mentored Amber Larson to an individual title in the 400 meter hurdles. Under his tutelage, eight men and 18 women set track and field school records and 96 athletes were accorded all American acclaim. Gary earned his PhD in exercise physiology and biomechanics in 2003. He published and presented papers on the biomechanics of running, both on land and in the water. His specialty is alternative training and rehabilitation for athletes, as well as effective use of aquatics to promote quality of life for everyone. In 2013, Dr. Kilgore founded AQX Sports Incorporated, a land and water-based training and rehabilitation system that has benefited athletes worldwide. In that year, Gary was, indu was inducted into the Linfield Athletics Hall of Fame. With this successful background, it's no surprise that Gary was chosen as Linfield's next athletic director. Gary and his family, wife Lisa and grown children Mike and Finn, also have a personal connection to Hillside. Gary's father-in-law, Dave Wallace, was a Hillside resident here for four years, and he was a cherished friend to many of us who knew him. We're so pleased that you could come this afternoon, Gary, and thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule to be with us, and welcome. Hopefully I unmuted this right. Give me a second to plug this back in. Thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about one of my favorite subjects on the planet. Before I get started with some of the Linfield things, I'm going to share something that's pretty personal about why I would do this. I was asked by, well, the current president, the vice presidents, et cetera, why would you give up being the most powerful faculty member on campus right now, because I was the FEC chair, which is a faculty executive council chair, somewhat like a faculty senate president. Why would you give that up to go to athletics? So you really don't know me very well, do you? The reason that I'm even here is because of athletics. I came from a poor uh, family that first generation went to college because I could run. Got recruited to do that, helped to pay for college. I didn't realize, because I spent a lot of time working um, from the time I was a very, very small kid, so that our family could afford to do things. My older brother and I, who's now, this older brother happens to be the CEO of a wood products company down in Eugene, but he and I, during the recession, worked for Richie's Market, which was a local market, to make it so that our family didn't have to do food stamps. And all of that it was because I think some of the lessons that we had learned up through athletics and those kinds of things that are related to that. So when this position came open, are you kidding me? <laughs> of course I'm going to jump right back over to that. And when you think about the NCAA Division III ethos of the scholar athlete, it made sense that someone who had earned a PhD in human performance should take that mantle, at least 
right now in the trajectory of, of Linfield. So when I was asked to to do this uh, presentation, I jumped at the opportunity, especially because of our personal uh, um, relationship with this community already. It was, uh, it, it was a no-brainer for me to be able to do this. So I thought that we could start off with a brief history. And then we'll go to where we are right now, because we made a lot of changes this year in terms of how we have approached some of the things that we're doing, and then where we want to go. And the word we, and the word all is going to be throughout this whole thing. This is never about me. It's never about one coach. It's never about one athlete. It's about all of those people working as one cohesive unit. That's an incredibly important thing for me to try to share with folks. This was all queued up and ready to go. Hey! hey. I'll be jiggered. We're, we're ready to go now. Good. Oh, by the way, they asked me when I first got here if I was going to stand behind the lectern. Oh, my gosh. No. Are you kidding? No. So hopefully, hopefully I'll burn a couple calories off on this side. So one of the things that we'll start off with is um, obviously first organized sport was football, as you know. That began in 1896. And... Of course you know about the streak that we have of 62 consecutive winning seasons. I'm not going to read, I don't read slides verbatim, I, I prefer not to. I know you can read, so that's good. <laughs> Baseball team was established in 1912. Since 1950, Linfield has employed just five head coaches. All were Linfield people. Um, somewhat like the athletic director thing that I took. Oh, by the way, I'm going to tell you a little site. And get used to this because I won't stay too much on a script. I don't like scripts very much. This summer, after I got started in July, I was at a, a birthday function. My birthday is actually July 4th. So we were at this big picnic. My, my nephew's father-in-law, a former CEO of Oregon Ironworks, comes up, he shakes my hand, and he goes, oh, I heard that you were just named athletic director of Linfield. Oh, no pressure there. <laughs> I said, oh, no. no, no. And then I told him a story about Scott Brocious. Scott Brocious told me once when we were talking about pressure. Um, I asked him about A-Rod, Alex Rodriguez, and he wasn't hitting very well, etc. And I said, he's got a huge amount of pressure on him right now. And he goes, he shouldn't. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, pressure's from within. And I thought, oh my gosh, what a great lesson. <laughs> Come tell everybody else that. That's probably why they won in 2013. So I jumped a little bit for you with that. Linfield won national baseball titles in 66, 71, and 2013. This might, is this working now? Yay, yippee skippy. Okay, origin of the men's basketball program goes back as far as 1919. And, of course, many of you realize that Ted Wilson coached there for 20 seasons and led the Wildcats to 10 conference titles between 61 and 81. And I heard stories long, long, long before I ever arrived at Linfield College about two people, Ad Rutschman and Ted Wilson. So when I came in, uh, when I was 29, come in, and I was sitting down in the locker room, and of course, Ted had just gotten through playing handball, which he loved to do back then. He's sitting in the locker room with me, and he asked how things are going. And I told him, ah, you know, because we weren't, our cupboard was not very full. That's a good way, of, that's a very polite way of saying it, meaning our team rosters were pretty low in track and cross country, and we were trying to get up so that we could be as competitive as football, basketball, baseball, softball, etc. I was bemoaning that a little bit, and he started laughing, and then he patted me on the shoulder, and he said, you were born a generation too late. And I took that as one of the best compliments I could ever get from someone like him because I admired the dickens out of he and Ad in terms of what they bring to the table about doing the right things and making sure that you honor those kinds of traditions. So let's see. Yay, it does work, still work. Yes, nice job. You get an air, air high five on that. <laughs> Origins of men's tennis goes back to 25. Um, and Dave Hansen, who many of you know is retired from the college now, was our dean of students, coached from 71 to 75. 
kind of an interesting aside. Women's tennis spawned in the 60s, and the Wildcats were dominant in women's tennis through the mid-2000s, winning 108 consecutive Northwest Conference matches between 2003 and 2009. And I am supremely blessed right now because I got that coach to come back to Linfield from Concordia where she was serving as a senior woman administrator and associate AD. I got her to take a pay cut and come to Linfield to be part of our administrative team. And she's an absolutely phenomenal role model for not just our women in the program, but our men as well. She's just a super great teammate to have. Swimming has been an organized sport at Linfield for 50 years. It wasn't quite as good until the Health, Human Performance, and Athletics building was completed in the fall of 1989 when I first arrived. That's when the building actually opened. And to Dale's credit, I'm going to give him a shout out on this because if you've been to the pool and actually really took a pretty good look around, the deck space there is incredible. Most pools don't give you that much deck space, but that's a, um, that's a godsend when you're talking about trying to do warm-ups and different kinds of activities on the deck before you actually get into the water. So it's a great aquatic complex. And of course, he got to enjoy some of that when he retired and came down to work with me in the pool with some of the stuff he was doing. Um, most of the the school records and all Americans and so on were pretty high in the early to mid 90s under Cindy Pemberton. And I think it's important to point that out, but I, I'm, later on I'm going to point out that right now, many of those records are getting obliterated by our new swimmers that we have within the program and Kyle Kimball who's doing a great job. Origins of the men's cross country team extend back to 66 with Hal Smith. I think most of you know Happy Hal Smith uh, was one of the, kind of the, the four horsemen <laughs> with Roy Helser and Ad and Ted Wilson. Um, but the women's cross country team came around in 1974 and a couple of championships uh, along the way with that. The men's cross country teams were very competitive in the conference and also our district and at the national level and were coached by Dr. George Oya, who was our department chair for a long time and who I think is the best cross country coach the college has ever had. That, uh, I think he was better than me. <laughs> and I think, the one that, I think the one that is there now, Mike Blackmore, um, is in that same ilk. He's very, very good, He's very gifted. Likewise, the early to mid 90s saw similar outstanding results. George and I were able to coach together for a few years before I switched and took over all, all of the program. Linfield Volleyball, now you should know this, with Shane Kamira with 40 years at Linfield College in women's volleyball. But guess what he's gonna do? He's retiring, quote unquote, but I talked him into coaching the women's golf team. <laughs> we, were, we were struggling to stabilize our golf programs because we, we don't have enough money in the budget right now. And so I went to, to him and I also went to uh, Mitch Wilson who is married to Casey Bunn. Wilson, our women's basketball coach, and they're now our new golf coaches. So it should be an interesting time. Even though we're going to throw him a little party at Golden Valley here in May, um, we still get to keep him around, so it'll, it'll be a lot of fun. So you, you probably know this too, they achieved a runner-up finish in the old um, AIWA for uh, volleyball back in, like I said, 1981. Women's basketball program has been in existence for more than 40 years. The hardest part about that is that uh, we have yet to get to the levels that uh, we are reaching right now. I have no doubt for you, and this is jumping ahead a little bit about the present, Casey Bunn Wilson is the real thing. You watch how she interacts with her women. You watch how they will play their hearts out for her, and you know that great things are coming. 
they've already made huge, huge strides. But I have told her more than once. Now, you should also know that she was what used to be the Pac-10. She was the Pac-10 Player of the Year for Oregon State, played professionally herself, hard-nosed competitor, but she has a great balance of compassion with that and knows the sport really well. She's doing a super job of leading our ladies within that program, so it's very exciting to see where they are. I told her that she can't leave here until I retire <laughs> or she uh, gets something along the way that just gives her so, such a, an opportunity that she can't turn that away. But I can't wait because there will be a time when I'm standing on half court with her hugging, saying yes to the new conference champs and yes to the birth at the NCAA championships. Men's soccer took root at Linfield in 1974, um, and the most successful coach in school history was Steve Simmons. He was back in the early 2000s. You may remember that. I'm not sure if you will or not, but he guided the team to two Northwest Conference titles, and they got third at the national tournament, which was an excellent showing. I am trying to get him to come home right now, and then we'll see how that goes. Women's soccer team's first recorded season was 1980 and started in the conference in 1985. First national championship in a women's team sport came in softball, and of course they did that in 2007 and 11. And Hopefully they'll be doing it again. I think many of you realize they just knocked off George Fox to win the actual tournament this last weekend. And they did it in one game. Didn't make it go to the two games. I like it. Hmm. 2011, uh, the softball team hit an NCAA record 103 home runs. In contrast, Linfield did not hit a single home run during the entire 1996 season. <laughs> Softball program won 11 consecutive Northwest Conference championships from 2004 to 2014. So we had a couple years where we weren't quite there. We were close, but not quite there. And, of course, I just let that cat out. I'm sorry. I got the comment. Yeah. Softball, I never watched till we retired here. Yeah. And you know something? Yeah. Those cows don't throw like a woman. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they have very good mechanics. They know how to throw. It's incredible. Yeah. And what you, what you, since, you, since you brought that up, I'm really glad that you did. Since you brought that up, if you watch our women in lacrosse too now, because we just changed lacrosse, they all know how to compete and they know how to come together as a team, and they work their fannies off, which is a, a, a great attribute. It's something that I'm exceedingly proud of. So it doesn't matter whether you're male, female, whatever, that stuff doesn't make any difference. What matters is that they're, they're doing a great job for Linfield. And you're right about that. They do have better mechanics now. <laughs> Thanks for bringing that up. That was a nice cue from my biomechanics background. <laughs> Okay, so Linfield men's and women's student athletes have won 22 NAIA and NCAA Division III individual championships in swimming and track and field. You heard some of that earlier. The early 90s saw the first individual national champions in both of those particular sports. Okay, a little bit about the athletic venues. Maxwell Field, this is not, I know, you know what we have, but we're supposed to say some of this. Maxwell Field. Football field first put into use. Funds to purchase a property were donated by the Maxwell family. Uh, 1931 was the original baseball field. Linfield and Davis Street, where Rutschman Field House is right now. And I do remember when I first got to Linfield, before our HHPA building, I was told that the hammer throw facility was kind of where our building is right now. Right, Dale? I think that's, that's right. And I think that somewhere along the line, someone was really happy when they moved it all the way out to the physical plant because of a couple of broken windshields in cars and going through hurdles and a few things like that. So that would be why I was able to keep a lot of weight off when I was a track coach because I could go all the way out to the hammer and come back through the discus and whatnot. 
Okay, so 1947, our current memorial stadium grandstand in the dorm was built, um, and that actually had something to do with the federal f funding of helping our GIs on their return home. So 1971, baseball field relocated to where we are right now. And, and of course, 90 is when everything got upgraded. Uh, one thing that I think no one in the conference would argue is that that is the best uh, baseball facility in the conference, bar none. It's it's really an outstanding facility, and that's due to Scott Carnahan and, and Scott Brocious, of course. Those two were instrumental in doing that, and naturally I would be remiss if I didn't mention, and some more money from Jim Wright and his steadfast commitment to the college. Soccer lacrosse field developed on the current site. Uh, we did that in a partnership with Hewlett Packard. I think most of you realize that we were able to acquire the properties from Hewlett Packard, which has been a, a boon to the college for sure. The Adam Joan Rutschman Field House was dedicated in 96, and that pretty much every athletic team that we have at some point or another uses the field house that we have. The tennis people would like it to be in a tennis only facility. <laughs> because they changed some rules with the ITA, and if it's a little bit uh, rainy or damp or whatever, they, they make them go indoors to play now. It's not like it used to be where they might wait a little bit for the weather to change or something. It's not like that. They have to go inside. So we're, we're fortunate there because it's right next to, our, of course, our outdoor um, stadium. This last weekend, yay, great weather. We hosted both track and field and the tennis championships at the same time, and of course they're right next to each other in venues. So that was a little fun with some of the people that we had, but it, it was great. I'll give you another aside about the field house. 96, one of my former uh, teammates, who's a three-time US Olympian for the decathlon and the pole vault, called and said, Gary, I heard you guys have a new field house that has a pole vault facility. And I said, yeah, Timmy, I do. And he goes, could we come and try it. So we had two 19 plus pole vaulters in there, both Olympians. They were both uh, teammates. Um, they jumped 18 feet in practice, in practice in the field house. Now, don't tell anybody else this other part. Then they got up onto the railing where you can see down into the field house where most spectators sit and were doing flips off into, <laughs> into the pole vault pits. Only pole vaulters. I had to look away because I was thinking of the liability associated with that. <laughs> and also a broken neck or two. I, I don't know. That, that would, would not be a good. Now, I'll go back even further on this. Before we had the field house, this is your cue. Dale, I went into, I went into Ad Rutschman when I first got here. And I think many of you might know that we had... Um, I enjoyed coaching pole vault quite a bit because it was a, a nice biomechanics laboratory experience for me all the time. And pole vaulters are a little crazy. So I can empathize with them. That's, that's a good thing. But when I got here, I went in to add Rutschman and said, where do I pole vault indoors? And he literally laughed at me. <laughs> I said, no, no, I'm serious. <laughs> where do we pole vault? Because I have the guy from Canada coming and I think we can make him a national champ, but he needs to vault indoors. So where do we go? And he said, well, we, don't, we haven't done that before. We don't do that. So I got permission from him to go to Dale, who was the CFO at the time and, and so on. He, he said I could go. Now, little did I know that Dale was a track athlete at Lewis and Clark. So I explained to him what I needed to do. He had heard that I can MacGyver things pretty well. So we ended up cutting a hole in the old school Riley gym, in the upstairs gym. I cut a hole in the floor, built a substructure, put a pole vault box into it, and they ran out of a little tiny room that was no bigger than a, a closet on steroids. And then they could run down and they could still vault indoors. Now, without his blessing, though, that couldn't have happened. And without Ad saying I could go ask him, that couldn't have happened. That person that did that went on to be a national champ. In fact, he won three national titles for Linfield and 
was also a Commonwealth Games uh, silver medalist. So it worked out pretty well for us. And then that started our pole vault tradition at Linfield, which, by the way, our women, women pole vaulters went one, two, three at conference this last weekend. Made the old guy really happy. I like that, especially since they're being coached by one of my former conference champs. All right, so back to the soccer lacrosse field. Um, Pride Linfield, well, we did that. No, it's the press box. Soccer lacrosse press box. Covered team, bench areas constructed. And there's going to be a little bit more where I talk about the particular soccer lacrosse. Um, then in 2008, uh, we had artificial field turf infield replace the natural grass at the baseball field. And I want to mention here that uh, Scott Carnahan really needs to get a lot of credit, I think. This is my opinion, but I think he needs to get a lot of credit because he was the quote-unquote builder of a lot of the athletic venues and facilities. And I think each, each athletic director will leave their own mark in some way or another, but I think that that really is something that uh, I would give him a lot of um, pats on the back for because without his guidance, without his vision, without his willingness to go get a lot of that stuff done, a lot of those venues probably wouldn't be here right now and they're, they're in decent shape. So all of our coaches used to be professors. Um, now the system has changed. The system, that's why I moved to the department chair. Um, which was more the academic side. And it was, my moving there was an effort to protect athletics, to make sure that it didn't go south in terms of this, this possible uh, split, a little bit of a split. And there still is this movement from our deans to separate us. Uh, I'm still working on some of the mechanics of what that means and how best to make that happen for people. And uh, I think that we have a, a plan that will satisfy that. I understand philosophically why that might be useful now, especially because we have um, coaches anymore. It's not like it was when, when I was a young coach. When I was a young coach, you could pick up a phone and you call people, although back in those days we had one telephone system at Linfield, you had to go through an operator so the kids could not call you back. <laughs> and we did not have email yet. It wasn't there. Text messaging didn't exist. Social media, no one knew what that was, not, not even a whisper of what that was. Anymore, the coaches are almost expected to be available to these prospective student athletes 24-7. And it's kind of a, a spooky thing. But that affects our ability to recruit. So we want to make sure that we give them enough time to do that. And we couldn't do that if they're in the classroom a lot where they're uh, not able to meet with the prospective students and their families and so on. So there is a good reason for some of that to happen. And I will always find a way to keep the human performance part with <laughs> athletics because we have to. Athletic training is now moving to a master's requirement. We're in the process right now. This was uh, something that came down from their governing bodies a couple of years ago. They voted to make it so that it, you have to have a master's degree in athletic training. Bachelors are going away. And so because of that, our highly, highly successful undergraduate program in athletic training won't exist anymore. So what I'm proposing with the new president is that we take a closer look at adding a master's program in athletic training so that we can still satisfy the academic requirements and still be of benefit to the ath athletic world as well. So and we'll see how that ends up. So where are we right now? Well, when I first came in back in July, many of you participated in this in some way or another, where we had online ticketing all of a sudden, which for some people was a little bit harder, but for others, not so much, especially when they figured out that they could call and talk to Jody, who's my administrative coordinator within the department, and her response would be, no problem at all. Come on in. We'll show you how to do it. We'll print them out for you right here. We'll take care of you. The, most important thing to me, and this is probably the business part, it's part of growing up 
working really hard in whatever else you're doing, is customer service. And it's also that we're a family. <laughs> and you're part of our family. And so we should be treated with the respect that you should be able to, to get in that kind of a scenario. And it shouldn't be too difficult to get the tickets. It shouldn't be that hard. So anyway, we went to the online ticketing and it gave us a chance to actually track ticketing better and more efficiently too. So there is a real, really pretty good reason for doing that. We, our uh, athletic training staff is moving around right now. We just, we have Dwayne Dewey, who's our head athletic trainer. We hired about four or five years ago, but he used to be the head athletic trainer at Portland State and is doing a, a superlative job of delivering the care for all of our student athletes. And whether anyone likes this or not, our student athletes are what makes Linfield even more special than it already is. It's a special place, there's no doubt but it makes it even more special. So we've got to be able to take good care of them when they're here. And that's part of, of that experience. The, we have newer people in the basketball program, Shannon Rosenberg on the men's side. They've been to the conference uh, tournament two years in a row now. And he and Casey Bunn Wilson both were ecstatic because they got their number one recruit this year. And they, of course, they came to find me and hug me and. Shannon, that's kind of hard because he's six foot eight and 300 pounds, and sometimes, <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you got to watch out for him coming at you like that. Um, and it is kind of funny with Casey, too, because she's much taller than me. She's um, six one or six two, so she has to kind of lean down. Plus, she's pregnant right now, <laughs> just in case you want to know that. <laughs> um, and then we changed some things within the administrative st staff as well, trying to make everything that I am doing is trying to make it so that we increase efficiency. We deliver what we should be delivering to people and that people have a great experience no matter no matter what they do. We are still now the golf thing. The reason I said we are working on getting golf, it's because they're still part time. They're not full time. And same with soccer. And by the way, Dr. Miles Davis, our new president that I'll be talking about in a minute here, I was on his search committee and we were sitting in the room. There's 20 plus people on the search committee, which is a huge search committee trustees, all that stuff, and it was his turn to, to ask questions. So what does he ask? Very first thing he asks, uh, Gary, what's up with your men's soccer program? <laughs> it's like, ooh, <laughs> well, and then I said, so by that, are you referencing where they are in the conference right now? Because I wasn't sure where he was headed with that. And he said, yes. And then I said, well, that's an artifact of when you do part-time positions and we can't stabilize the program over a long haul, that's what will happen. If we can stabilize the program, they will be just like our other programs. They're going to be vying for the top three in our conference year in and year out. So, and I said, thank you for asking me too, because he did it in front of all the trustees who help us with the money part. So it's like, okay, that, that, that'll work. Good. But the same is true on our, on our golf side. So those two things are challenges for me right now of trying to figure out how we can actually make the soccer programs more viable. Um, we had a change in lacrosse this year. We had a, a young coach that was only here a year and a half. She came in and after a couple of conversations with both Amy, our SWA and I, she came in and decided that maybe this wasn't the right fit for her. But she did that two weeks before the season started. Okay, so we let her do that, which was fine. Walked down the hallway, talked to Dwayne Dewey, our head athletic trainer, whose daughter plays on the lacrosse team. What do you think with Brittany, our assistant coach? The girls love her. <clears throat> She's going to be great. Okay, so I pick up a phone, call Brittany. Bing, bang, bong. She's in as interim head coach. And do you, do you know what happened this year? They got third in the conference this year, and they ended up knocking off Brittany's alma mater, was Pacific, knocked them off twice in the same season. So all things considered, it worked out really well for the program, and we definitely want her to stay with us in a permanent position. She's actually working out at Yamhill Carlton as a teacher, and then she is paying off her student loans by 
working in that particular school district. So it's a great opportunity for her as well. Um, so most of you know that enrollment continues to be down at Linfield, but that's not atypical for most of the small private schools. George Fox is up a little bit right now because they keep adding programs. Um, and of course, I think many of you recognize that fiscally we've been awfully responsible for years and years and years. We've always had a balanced budget, or at least for as long as I can remember, we've had a balanced budget, which is a great thing. Um, and as far as I understand it, that some of the schools, if you add too much too soon, you can spread out and make it so that you really overexpose the college to long-term issues. So I, I think we're, we're fine on that. But part of the reason that I bring that up, uh, last year when Scott and I did, uh, Scott Carnahan and I did a uh, athletic department meeting together, it was more Scott's last one and the first one for me in that role. So Scott was leading through, leading through, and then he gets pretty much to the end. And then he shares with everybody that, one, he really enjoys all of the coaches, which is great. Then that he is worried about the future of Linfield and some, some things like that, which I think was fair for him to be able to say that. Then he asked if I had anything to add. I said, well, as a matter of fact, I do. Thanks. So I asked the coaches to join me and make it our, our goal is to make it so that our enrollment doesn't suffer. Let's work even harder. Let's raise the bar and go get these people because we can do this just like back in the 70s or so, right after Bjork, <laughs> when the college almost closed and they have to go to Ad Rutschman and say, go get us some people. He did this same kind of thing. So I've challenged our coaches to go get it, and they are. They're, they're a remarkable group of people, and they know that the health and the vibrancy of, of the college can revolve around what we can do to help with that. We should help, we should help no matter what. Um, take, they take great care of their kids, and that's the most important thing to me, is that it doesn't matter if you can recruit them here, if you can't then help them in the classroom, make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do, make sure they're doing the social things right, holding them accountable for the things that are kind of goofy that kids do every once in a while, but making sure that we're, we're consistently doing the Lou Holtz way of do what is right, do your best, and do unto others. If you have those as your rules, and that's your guiding principle, then that athletic department will flourish, the college will flourish, and everybody will be in pretty good shape. Now, all of us place a high value on that beautiful marriage between academics and athletics. And Ad in particular used to say that athletics should be viewed as another classroom. It's something that I totally agree with. I came up, uh, I shouldn't say it that way, we came up this year with all-in attitude. It's advancing Linfield's legacy in athletics. And I challenged our student athletes to rise with us, that if we do this together, what will happen is that every single school that comes against us, they don't just go against the basketball team they're playing that night. They go against all of us. And that should scare them. <laughs> that should make it so that it's more like the old school house of hustle when you go into the basketball court in Riley where people were basically on top of you and saying, I heard really interesting things. So we'll see. But that, that messaging has worked in, in pretty darn well with all of our student athletes. It works really well with uh, the uh, coaches and staff. So this year, this is another new thing. This is a graduation stool. This will be worn over the student athletes' regalia as they walk across that stage. I can't wait to see how many of these walk across that stage. It'll be a great representation of the almost 40% of our student body who are made up of student athletes. But because many of those kids also win other awards in whatever their academic discipline is. 
So by putting those things together, I think it's a, a great idea of strengthening that concept of the marriage between academics and athletics. We are going to do a separate <clears throat> special ceremony for our student athletes. I'm going to wear my total doctoral regalia and I, I in conjunction with the SWA and the assistant AD, we will be placing these on our student athletes so their parents can see them ahead of time before we actually go to the graduation ceremony. So something that's, that's new, we're trying to make sure that we do everything we can to make it a great experience for everybody. Okay, um, oh yeah, I think you already knew about the Street Street. We just did this again over the weekend. We brought in food carts. I closed off just a little part of Lever Street. We had a Hawaiian food cart, we had a taco cart, and we had Dutch Brothers, of course. Now, Dutch Brothers is really nice to us. They're very nice to us. They, they donate a lot of things. They made our scholar-athlete part of our Hall of Fame building. They made that possible. They paid for that. It's 20 grand. They made sure that we had all of the wallpaper that highlights all of our student athletes and their academic accomplishments as well as their athletic ones. So it's great to be able to say, yeah, come and park your truck out there and make some money too. That, <laughs> that'll be good. But what we're trying to do with that Streak Street is to make it a, a, a more family-like atmosphere, a fun atmosphere where the kids can play a beanbag toss or they can drop their posters and do, do that kind of thing. In addition to this, at the halftime, or sorry, it was before the game, we highlighted all of the faculty who had won faculty achievement awards. Because I realized that we need to keep strengthening the bonds between those professors and also what is happening in athletics. And that went over really well. It was pretty fun to see some of the professors because I made them actually have to high five and hug me when they came out. So that was kind of even even Tom Helley, and he's not he's not very uh, he's not usually that that warm about that, but he's come around with me, so it's 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 going okay. <laughs> okay, the other thing that I think that we have to do is we we're supposed to set the standards for our kids. And with our coaches and myself included, um, I hold myself to a pretty high standard all the time. But I think that we should never ask anyone to do anything that we haven't done or wouldn't do. And that keeps us in the right frame of mind about what we should be modeling for behavior, I think. Uh, there's an example of that. Can you see that picture? Yes, that would be, those would be whipped cream pies that I took in the face for two hours. That would be why I have a plastic bag on, and I'm surprised that I can still put my thumb up right then, because I was probably wiping whipped cream off of my uh, face over and over and over. But I've jumped at every opportunity like this that I can to let them know it's okay to have some fun too. <laughs> it's, it's good. It's not that was gross. I took two showers to get that out of my. I'm afraid that whipped cream got in my mustache and it. Woo! That was not good. <laughs> okay, uh, where are we going uh, beyond what, what we've just been talking about? So new soccer lacrosse complex, we ha have gotten the renderings back and the cost analysis on that, and we really need to get a field turf field put in there. And that will take pressure off of the current football and track field that is there. So we have so many people that are coming and going off of that, and then we can have permanent lines painted on those as well. So Joe doesn't have to get bent out of shape at me when we have to put temporary lines during football season. But we have a cost on that. It's a, it's um, the total is about 4.6, but that's 4.6 million. But that includes locker rooms and a new press box area and new bleachers and the field itself. That's a long-term thing. Hopefully, we'll be able to get to that. But for now, the field is what we're at, actually after. And, but we, we know that that's not going to happen um, within the next uh, couple of months, that's for sure. The field itself is still about 1.6. But the, the vice president for Boehner played baseball for Linfield. And so they have committed to us that it won't cost us quite that amount. So we'll just put it that way. That's, that's very good. Then I listed this Palm Springs trip. We, Joe Smith and I were able to go down to Palm Springs with some alums of ours. 
uh, flew down in the Pacific Office Automation corporate jet. The CEO's son played football for us, and we talked about what they can do to help us in the long term. We know that we have to get a fitness center. We need a new fitness center that will really satisfy the needs of the general population kids there. Any more, when stu prospective students come in and their families, they, they look at that kind of thing pretty, pretty dramatically. And if it's, if it's not with a few bells and whistles, they will end up going to another place that does have that opportunity. And if we lose our students to like 24-hour fitness or something like that, that's, that's not good. They should be able to get that kind of thing right there. Plus, we just added a sport management major at the college. We've had it as a minor. It was our most popular minor for a few years now. We turned it into a major, and my goal is that we would allow then those interns that have to go through the sport management program, they would actually run the fitness center for the general population kids and it gives them hands-on experiences with what they want to do long term with the rest of their life and it goes right with one of the core values of Linfield College about experiential learning you should be able to bring that to life for people so anyway we talked to them about the new fitness center but I also would love to see um, a sports performance center that has the ability to have the athletes get their weights and their strength and conditioning stuff so that they're not all in there together. Right now, if you walk into our weight room, as wonderful as it has been, it's too small. We've outgrown it for the kinds of needs that, that we have right now. So you'll go in, and some of the general population kids can't really get as effective of a workout in with all of the athletes in there, too, and vice versa sometimes. So we're trying to put that together as well. Now, I have a different reason for this. The other part of this has to do with the academic part. It has to do with if we go with a study of sports sciences, which is a corollary of the exercise science that I've been doing, we will be separate from all of the colleges and universities around here. No one offers it like that yet. And I'm worried that if we don't get there before someone else does, someone else is gonna wake up and do that. When I was doing the water training things I would go to I went to Europe eight times to be able to give presentations on the water stuff that I was doing and every single place I went it didn't matter England Ireland Spain whatever they all have sports science teams that support not not only the professional athletes but also all the way down and if we can produce that next generation of those people then we're going to be in great shape Many of you might know the name Ella Riddle. She's a three-time All-American in tennis for us. Um, she's been the player of the year in the conference and just won singles again this weekend. Her father, Dean Riddle, is with the Seattle Seahawks and is exactly what I'm talking about. So I told him what I wanted to do, and he said, you guys are behind, <laughs> meaning that Australia and where he's from originally, they already do this, and Europe already does it. And I said, I know, I know, so I, I want that model to come in here. And what a great place to do it, right here in little old McMinnville. It's not that far away from Portland and some other places. So, you know, we could do testing on some of the higher level athletes if they fly in and that kind of thing. So it should be good. By the way, the guy who took my place on the faculty is here because he likes that idea a lot and would like to be the director of the sport performance area. And his research happens to be in that area. So it'll all start to come together eventually. Uh, by the way, there is a talk of a stadium renovation too. Right now, <laughs> we're not sure how much more money to throw at a uh, memorial because we're chasing older electricity, older plumbing, old, you know, things like that. And we want to make sure that, that we're doing a good job of providing a nice, safe kind of a stadium for everybody too. So anyway, that was part of the discussion. One of the people that we met with as well as this group of people uh, was R Rich Brooks, the former U of O head football coach and athletic director. He had dinner with us. He is willing to serve on my athletic um, advisory board at Linfield. And then he told me a story, of course. All coaches tell stories. 
But he told me how he recruited Ad Rutschman to be his offensive coordinator. Now, I had already heard that story from Ad, so I knew that that, that had already happened. Then I t got home, called Ad to tell him that we had visited with Rich Brooks, and then he told me the story again. <laughs> so I know for sure that he did get recruited to be the offensive coordinator at U of O. And I'm really grateful to him for not taking it. I'm glad that he stayed here at, at, at Linfield. Um, another thing that we're looking at, though, is an indoor track and field facility that serves many sports. This is not actually um, a classic indoor-only track and field thing. It's because of the field space where baseball, football, softball, lacrosse, soccer could also go in there and do their off-season training that uh, usually they're dancing around raindrops. And so it makes it a little bit uh, safer for them as well. But we can generate revenue that way because we can host indoor track and field meets and we would make a lot of money. University of Washington has been doing that and they have, they have the, they've cornered the market out on the west, northwest area. And because of that, they charge exorbitant amounts of money and they don't exactly, they're not very user friendly with the smaller colleges. It's more for the bigger ones. So if we do this, we'll make it so that uh, we'll be able to make it a lot more user friendly. So last things, uh, our new president, Dr. Miles Davis. I, uh, you saw me smile already when I started to just think about him. Uh, I served on the search committee, like I said earlier, and it, it very laborious process. But when Dr. Davis, when we first met him, one of our trustees, and hopefully she wouldn't mind if I shared this, but one of our trustees had just lost her mother and just found out right there at the where we were uh, doing the interviews. And so she was out in the hallway taking this phone call. He happens to bump into her, asked if she was okay, and she shared that information with him. Then he asked permission to hug her. Then they hug. Then he came in the door and actually started off by, by sharing a little bit, because we didn't know yet. The people on the search committee didn't even know yet, because it had happened you know, just right before that. And I thought, ooh, I like that guy already. That's a really very, very thing to do and a very appropriate thing to do. He comes in and he's very warm, very engaging, very effusive, and he makes connections with people really uh, fairly quickly. So I think that you will find him to be a lot of, uh, a lot of fun to be around as a, as a president. He, I told him that, you know, it strikes me that our backgrounds are very similar. His response to me was, Oh, you were a black poor kid? <laughs> I, said, I said, no, I was a white poor kid though, but poor is poor. And his response spoke volumes. He said, you got that right, brother. And he gave me a fist bump and he smiled. And I thought, that's exactly the kind of response that you should have, that you're not you know, making it, it's not about race or it's not about any of that kind of stuff but um, he also just so you know this he he went to a community college like I did too same kinds of reasons I think for why he did that then he was in the Navy in the US Navy he was a pilot um, and was in the Gulf War I think it was then he finishes his doctorate and he has an entrepreneurial <laughs> background a bit so that's another thing that I think we share a little bit uh, with but his core values as, as I've gotten to know him better and better and better his core values fit Linfield exceedingly well he's I think the right president for us at the right time in our overall college trajectory he knows that enrollment is there but he also knows that we can be helpful in terms of producing um, classes that will be very good uh, and I he knows that there are some challenges ahead but what he sees is the potential he's a coach at heart and he literally is a coach he coaches soccer hmm. so maybe those full-time <laughs> soccer jobs really will happen now that would be good so we'll see how that goes in and his son and daughter both played division one um, soccer back east so kind of a good thing 
And anything else you'd like to know about him, you can let me know. His doctorate is in organizational um, behavior and management, which is kind of a great thing for a president, I would think. But his minor was chaos theory out of physics, which is also probably good for working with faculty members. <laughs> so hopefully he can control the chaos within that group. That, that, that's pretty good. And by the way, I, I, can, I can teasingly say that kind of things, but I, I thoroughly respect most of my colleagues by far. We have great faculty at Linfield, and, and they do remarkable things. So it's very good. OK. Uh, we already talked about that, that uh, part about what what we are supposed to do. The bottom line is that this is what I have challenged. I've challenged our athletes with this notion for years. How do I want to be remembered? Do I want to be remembered as the, the person that didn't want to quite finish workouts? Do I want to be remembered as the person that was the go-to person? That was, give me the ball. Let me take it. I, I'm good. <laughs> Let me have that. How do I really want to be remembered? So you challenge the, the challenge with our coaches is the same. And it helps them kind of remember where the moral compass has to be within the context of the rest of what they, they do. And it's the rest of what I do. And every day, and I still do, I'm reading a, a mindful leader book right now. And leading with compassion and leading with passion that goes with the compassion is so outstanding if you can do it the right way. So that's my challenge to um, everybody around me. OK, thank you. And <laughs> go cats. I know I got a little long-winded, so sorry about that. OK, questions? Oh, Microphone. if you have any. I have one. Yeah. In my day, we had um, the athletes, and, and, and then we had intramurals. Do you still have that kind of program? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll say that again because the mic wasn't there. She was asking about intramurals, if we still have intramurals. And as a matter of fact, I'm glad that you brought that up because, yes, we do. Right now, what has happened with intramurals is it's been vetted primarily through student services. But there's a movement from the deans to put it under, under me with athletics. Um, that makes a ton of sense to me. And having one of the coaches have that as a secondary um, job makes sense, I think, especially because of the con <laughs> the built-in conflicts with all the facilities and scheduling and all that kind of thing. And I, uh, this is something I'm glad that you brought that up because it, it leads to a different kind of a thing. At the recent NCAA convention, the the chair of the president's council is the president of uh, Adrian College in uh, Michigan. When he got to Adrian. Their enrollment was 700 kids, or right around that number. Now, it's 1,600 kids. And not in a very long period of time. It was within about four years. Everybody's going, how did you get there? You know how he got there? He got there on our backs. He got there with athletics, and he added, made the intramural stuff better, made club sports better. They even have a bass fishing club. So I think we'll be adding a fly fishing one. <laughs> so we have a fly, we have a few fly fishermen on the on the coaching staff. So we could probably figure <laughs> figure that out. But the goal is to give our students across the campus many many reasons to stay, not just the one academic program or not just the football team either. It's not, it can't be like that. It has to be that holistic educational opportunity. And if you can do that, that increases retention as well. And so. You know, it does two things. It, one, it gets them there, and then hopefully it hooks them and keeps them there. Yeah, so that's good. That's a good question. Thanks. Yes? Uh, this is really more a See, this is on. than a question. Okay. I'm used and, to that with you. And <laughs> your comment that 40% um, of the yeah. uh, students are enrollment, um, and I just want to emphasize the importance that really means to the college. Uh, I was a counterpart to Dale at a small college in Vermont. And up between 30 and 40 percent of our students were recruited by coaches. Mm -hmm. 
And when you look at three institutions here in the Northwest that recently had, they had dropped football many years ago, and now they've taken them up again. Pacific, mm -hmm. George Fox, yep. College of Idaho in Caldwell, Idaho. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the recruiting, yep. they get more enrollment through athletics, and it's just right. an extremely valuable part of particularly the small college life. And that's why I am such a strong proponent. Those of us that went to the small schools are very fortunate people. I'm not saying we're necessarily better, but we had a much better, I think, more rounded experience than you would in the big state colleges and universities. I'll be sure and give you your $50 later. <laughs> <laughs> I planted him, could you tell? <laughs> thank you. Now, all kidding aside, that I'm, thank you. You commented on the importance <coughs> of technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in 1992, when Vivian Bull became as president, she was on the East Coast, she called me and said, Dale, what's my email address? And I said, Vivian, what's email? <laughs> no, we've come a long way. Right. Well, thank you very much again. Come by and see me anytime. Uh, thank you so much, Gary. This has been wonderful. I had no idea. I knew you had a huge job, but I had no idea how huge it was. And I certainly feel, I know everybody here does, uh, how fortunate Linfield is to have you at the helm. Uh, it is just, you're the perfect person. Thank you. Thank you very much.